Good afternoon. Thank you to all of you who are here with us in person in West Des Moines, to those who are watching with our foster group team in Omaha, and those who are watching virtually really around the country. We're genuinely thankful and glad that you've chosen to join us for what we think will be a great conversation with two very special guests. I'm Kent Kramer. I'm fortunate to serve as the Chief Investment Officer for Foster Group, and today I'll be directing our conversation around to think about and live in a world filled with uncertainty. Our two guests have both had remarkable experiences and high degrees of success over many decades. This makes their perspectives about how they personally lived with and invested in times filled with uncertainty not only interesting, but helpful as we navigate the uncertainty in our world today. Former U.S. Senator and Hall of Fame NBA basketball player Bill Bradley served in the U.S. Senate from 1979 to 1997, representing the state of New Jersey, and was a candidate for President of the United States in 2000. Prior to his political life, he was an Olympic gold medalist in 1964 with the U.S. basketball team and then played for the New York Knicks from 1967 to 1977, helping to win two NBA championships. In 1982, he was elected to the Basketball Hall of Fame. Not a slouch academically, Senator Bradley was also a Rhodes Scholar with a BA in American History from Princeton and an MA from Oxford, and has served as a visiting professor at Stanford, Notre Dame, and the University of Maryland. He's authored seven books. He hosts a weekly radio show on Sirius called American Voices, and recently has created and performed a one-man show entitled Rolling Along. David Booth is the founder and executive chairman of one of the world's top investment companies, Dimensional Fund Advisors. David is also a remarkable philanthropist, funding higher education and art initiatives. His family's 2008 gift to the University of Chicago Booth School of Business was the largest of its kind and the school is now named in his honor. A University of Kansas alumnus with an undergrad and graduate degree from there, I know that David is an avid fan and supporter of the Jayhawks. David, that might not endear you to some of our Iowa State Cyclone fans in the audience today. For those familiar with ESPN's 30 for 30 series, David was the key player in the January 2013 episode, There's No Place Like Home, in which he acquired the original rules of basketball penned by John Naismith in an auction by Sotheby's in 2010. He then donated those rules to the University of Kansas where they're now displayed in the Booth Family Hall of Athletics Museum, which is connected to Allen Fieldhouse. It's a great story and one worth watching for those of you who haven't seen it. Back to David's contributions to the world of investing. Low-cost index funds are something we take for granted today as investors, but David helped launch one of the original index funds in the 1970s and has been a pioneer and leader in applying financial research and theory to produce practical and accessible investment strategies for everyday investors. One of my favorite comments from David is how he has always wanted to make a better investment experience available to every investor, regardless of portfolio size. So please join me in welcoming our guests, Senator Bill Bradley and David Booth. So one of the things you don't know, uh, <laughs> audience, is that we uh, just got these guys. They were uh, actually in downtown Des Moines just maybe 15 <laughs> minutes ago. Thinking they were, uh, somebody thought they were at the Embassy Club downtown. So we're glad that you guys made it. Uh, thanks for being here. <laughs> this is, uh, we'll just get ready to go. Um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. And for those people who are watching online in various places, we're glad that you're here also. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to talk about for a while, and I think all of you have questions about these things as well, is hey, these times seem really uncertain that we're living in right now, uh, maybe more uncertain than ever for some of us. We just feel like, gosh, the political environment is polarized, we've got economic issues, the stock market is down, we're just coming off of a pandemic. There's all kinds of things that contribute to this sense of unease or uncertainty, and we're wondering, hmm, what's next? Uh, one of my favorite quotes from the last three years is by a guy named Daniel Kahneman. He says, the thing to learn from surprises is that the world is a surprising place. Uh, it's kind of an interesting idea, but when I thought about maybe where we'd start, I thought I'd just ask you guys maybe what have been some of the surprising things that you've seen in the last three to five years? Well, I mean, there, uh, let me just start off by saying um, that, yeah, there's a lot of uncertainty now, but there's always a lot of uncertainty. I mean, you think back the pandemic, do we have more uncertainty now than in March of 2020? I don't know or 2008, 2009. Yeah, the, the, the cool thing about uncertainty, and it's really fundamental for investing, which is it's the uncertainty that creates the opportunity. If there are no uncertainty, 
there wouldn't be an opportunity to capture you know, the rates of return on stocks that we've achieved historically mm -hmm. on the order of 10% a year. In other words, suppose there were no uncertainty, then there would be no risk. So all instruments would pay the kind of a money market rate. That, that, that would, that, and that would be it. Not you'd be, you'd be out of a job. I'd be. <laughs> you'd be out of a job. And, uh, you know, there would be no planning. Mm -hmm. So it's the, it's the, uh, it is the unease cre that creates uncertainty, but it's what creates the long, you know, mm -hmm. um, the opportunity long term. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah, how about you? Last three years, anything really surprised you? <laughs> well, there's the personal uncertainty that the pandemic posed for each of us. So how we live our lives and how we love our families and how we protect our friends and ourselves. Um, that was a time of real uncertainty. Uh, there is uh, geopolitical uncertainty with the war in Ukraine and uh, with uh, the Chinese moves that they've made recently. And um, economic uncertainty too, partly as a result of those two previous uh, areas of uncertainty, but uncertainty is what life's all about. I mean, you know, I, it was uncertain today if I got up, if I'd be able to get here in time. <laughs> we went to the place downtown for Des Moines for the, for the first meeting. That, so it was uncertain there too. So when you think about it, Senator, I, I know you're a history guy. So when you look at the level of uncertainty or surprise, or whatever it might be that we're experiencing today, would you, how would you rank kind of level of uncertainty today relative to other times in history? Are we living in the most uncertain time ever? Well, if you grew up in the United States in the 1840s and 50s, you'd say it was a pretty uncertain place. And that uncertainty, of course, led to the Civil War, which uh, was not a, a great result for everyone to have to experience the war. On the other hand, at the end of World War II, when we won World War II, and there was uncertainty about, well, what would the world look like after World War II? You found uh, political leadership that essentially structured the world economy in such a way that gave uh, the highest standard of living the greatest number of people in, in uh, world history. And I always like to think about uh, uncertainty often is the mother of invention. And uh, I mean, there was a time in the United States, for example, when uh, the elderly were by and large poor and had no health insurance. When the Great Lakes were industrial sewers, when women and African-Americans didn't have a right to vote, when corporations did whatever they wanted to their customers and their employees. but. Uh, that changed over time, partly political leadership, partly because the values of the country emerged to say that more people should have a fair share. So um, we'll always be in uncertain times, and a lot of times good things come out of uncertain times. So let me just follow up, kind of bring that forward in time a little bit. I know, so my mom, who's actually here today, so I have to really be on my best behavior. <laughs> uh, but. When she was a U.S. ambassador, I remember her telling me one of the things that took her a while to get used to was the security briefing. So it'd be a security briefing about kind of all the threats around the world. And she said for a while that was pretty unsettling because it just felt like every day things could just tip into chaos. Uh, they never did. But nevertheless, there was that information out there that things looked serious. Now, when you were in the Senate, I have to believe that there were some times when you were privy to some things that would make you feel like things were a little uncertain. Are there any stories that you could share and maybe how you even thought about that over time, seeing that kind of uncertainty? Well, there are certain things that you can control and certain things you can't control. And a lot of the uncertainty comes from things you can't control. So when you hear all of the bad things that are happening or could happen in the world, other than choosing someone who could lead the country who you thought would reflect your values and be competent enough to deal with some of these, you live your life every day with your family and your community, and you live your life in a way that's consistent with your values. And to me, that's always what's sustained me. I mean, when I left briefings in the Senate on the Intelligence Committee, and uh, I was a little shocked by what I was told, 
Um, other than trying to change that within the committee, uh, I didn't lose sleep over it at night because uh, I was going to do what I could do, which was in the committee with the vote. Mm -hmm. And after that, I was going to go home and play with my daughter. <laughs> So David, you mentioned a little bit about kind of markets and the structure of markets, rewarding risk. Uh, when you think about where we are in the markets today, relative to where things maybe have been over time, let's say in the last 50, 60 years, how do you measure the level of uncertainty or risk in the markets today versus in the past? Are we really in a different spot? Well, I, I think, um, let me just comment that uh, sometimes I think people spend too much time trying to predict what will happen, uh, rather than thinking about what can happen. Um, so when you start focusing on what can happen, you know, there's, a, there's a wide range of outcomes, and you, you ought to consider all of those. Um, you know, what, what are you going to do if the market drops another 25%? What are you going to do if it goes up 50%? Uh, I mean, it's, uh, these are um, things you always want to consider. Um, and well, actually, we have a better ability to predict uh, the uncertainty than we do the outcome, um, in the sense that if you look at the measures of uh, volatility, we have the VIX or whatever, it's uh, definitely elevated now. So, uh, and you don't have to look at this week. I mean, the markets, you know, or, or this month, you know, this month. it's up like crazy, <laughs> down like crazy. That's a sign of the volatility. Yeah. And, um, I think uh, we need to prepare for the, the kind of volatility over the next few months anyway. Mm -hmm. what, at some point you've called this kind of the old normal. I think that was a phrase that you coined. Um, so why does it feel different today, do you think? Well, it always feels different. I mean, uh, <laughs> people talk about the new normal, the old normal, or whatever. Uh, I think the new normal is the old normal, it'll be the next normal. You're basically, here again, you get paid uh, the markets do a good job of sorting through uh, all the information out there. You think of the stock market as a giant information processing machine, and you know it does. It, you know, on average, it does you know a good job. It doesn't forecast things uh, you know perfectly, but it uh, the market market forecasts of things like volatility are better than than the individuals trying to predict it. So you're better off uh, trusting the market. Like today, the market's down a bit. Um, the markets uh, are always setting prices uh, so that to induce new investors to come into the market. In other words, that's, you know, so if it has to drop further to get people in, then it will. But the good news is, you know, from um, going forward, then you would expect a positive outcome. Yeah. I think one of the things I know that I've learned over the years listening to you and others is this idea that the prices are settling to where that price today represents some kind of expected return. Right. So people who are selling, there's also somebody on the other side of the transaction who's buying saying, well, at that price, That's right. I think the expected return is reasonable. I'm willing to take the risk that over time I'm going to be rewarded from this price. Right. I mean, it's, and people, there's just no compelling evidence that people can do, can outguess the market. You know, the, no matter how smart you are, the market's smarter than you are. <laughs> <laughs> smarter than I am, for sure. And just uh, in my time being associated with David and Dimensional, uh, the one statistic that uh, really strikes me is that uh, over the last, what, 70 years, 80 years, the market has gone up on average of 10% a year, 7% in real terms. So what does that tell you? That was, I mean, when we were in World War II, or in the day, Great Depression, yeah. The market over time will do that. So that means be a long-term player, stay in the market, don't be fearful. It's a little hard sometimes, all right? I mean, there's some hard. things that make us feel like it's a little different today. I think that's, though it may not be, and I think that's the point of looking at history, right? You go, history tends to... Well, and also you, exactly might, you might even think that in periods of greater uncertainty, that's when your expected return is the highest. There's some weak evidence of that sort of thing. So this would be... Uh, um, I'm not, I, don't want to, I don't want anybody to think I'm trying to forecast anything here. <laughs> we talk about, uh, I know one of the phrases that I like to use is, you know, rather than try to predict the future, let's try to prepare for a variety of outcomes. Absolutely. And so that's really what, you know, the diversified portfolio and looking around the world for opportunities does. Senator, I think about the way people feel today. Um, 
you know, we can talk about whether it's real or not, but I think people feel a heightened sense of uncertainty or worry. What do you think might be feeding into that fear? And, and I, I'll lead you a little bit there because I think about things like social media or the media in general, or even politicians and parties and the way they posture themselves today. How, how are those affecting the way people feel? Well, a lot of times people can't see the longer term because they're constantly bombarded by the short term on social media, the nightly news, some guy saying this stock or that stock, arguing from no real information. Um, and so I, it's difficult to have patience and to think about the long term. And that's the whole thing David talks about, uh, patient investing. And uh, you can easily get caught up in this. I just don't turn it on. I mean, I don't watch Squawk Box, for example. I like, I mean, Kramer's entertaining, but as somebody that I might listen to, you know, I, I don't do that. I think that's a good kind of segue here, and I think about it, what do, the, what have, kind of habits have the two of you developed to maybe filter out the noise? Well, it, it, <clears throat> I think it's so important to filter out the noise because once you really fully appreciate, let's call it the miracle of markets, that you got millions of people out there every day trading, and they don't trade unless they think they got a good deal. Mm -hmm. um, and what comes out is uh, kind of a very, you know, sensible. Um, markets are pretty sensible for sensible reasons. I mean, they, you know, they're everybody's doing all this analysis, and you have kind of the, the wisdom of crowds working for you. So if you um, once you embrace that idea that, you know, trust the market. Uh, it's, um, it's not perfect, but it's better, than, it's better than anything else we know. And you, as long as you've got the right asset mix between risky assets and risk, relatively riskless, riskless assets, you're probably going to be fine. There's, not, there's nothing else you can do, really. Yeah, it goes back to, I think, what Senator, you said, you do what you can, think you've done, and then you go on, do the next thing. And, it, and the important thing for everybody is to accept that. Once you accept it, then you can kind of relax a bit, a bit. play with your daughter or whatever. <laughs> I think that accepting uh, thing, when I, I know talking with many of you over the years, part of, it's, it's maybe not a one and done kind of a thing in terms of accepting. No, you want to monitor, yeah. You, every, every situation creates a new feeling or a new opportunity to kind of check back and go, do I still believe today what I believed in the past, and we kind of go through a reacceptance of, no, I still think that's the best way to move. Yeah, you know, let me give you an example. You know, let's go back 25 years ago. I mean, 25 years ago, could you have predicted where you are today? Or 25 years ago, what would have been your guess about the market? And suppose, for example, I said, okay, well, you know, in 98, we're going to have a Russian default. We're going to have then, uh, you know, the tech boom and bust. We're going to have 9-11. We're going to have, you know, the financial great, great recession. Want to have the pandemic, you know? Yeah, would those are all things that happen, right? If I told you that back in 25 years ago, would you have bought stock back then? <laughs> I mean, I see some people blushing here, you know. I mean, they, 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 it'd be difficult. But over that time period, uh, the last 25 calendar years, the stocks have done about 10% a year, just kind of like their long-term average. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the miracle of markets. Yep, a little mm -hmm. bumpy on the way there. Well, but Bobby, there. I mean, you focus on the bad news, but there's the upside to uncertainty as well. Yes. And uh, kind of these, these, these events uh, turn out uh, a lot of times unexpected outcomes, but they shouldn't be surprised to people. I mean, that's the difference. Yeah. I mean, I'm, uh, it depends on who you are, too. Um, I'm not a uh, transactional trading short-term person, you know. And in politics, I always thought a long-term, maybe that was a problem in politics. <laughs> I should have thought in the short-term. But, <laughs> but I'm just not like that. And so when it comes to this, I, you know, analyze the situation, make your call, make your investment, hold it for the long-term. And uh, then I can sleep at night and I don't have to worry. 
Senator, let me ask you a, kind of a general, kind of a broader question. I, I've read your book. Got this one right here, just a little plug. Mm. Here. Um, but in there, you come across as somewhat of an optimist, I would say. I've heard you even say that you're an optimist. Um, so how has that optimism been tested, let's say, the last five to 10 years? Or has it been tested? How has, what been how has been your tested? optimism, your sense of optimism, oh. been tested? <laughs> uh, well, it's been tested because of all the bad news that's coming in. And yet, uh, you know, science tells me, whether it's financial science or whether it's uh, uh, medical science, that the world's going to be a much better place. That there are people out there today that are inventing things that are going to make our lives better in the long term. And they'll probably be rewarded for it economically. That makes me feel good. And the second thing is, uh, however difficult it is to believe right now, things are not as dark politically as they were right before the Civil War. And the one thing that we have in this country is the ability to regenerate ourselves politically if an individual steps forward and um, takes action. I mean, to me, uh, you know, the story of America is the story of the vote, who gets it and how they use it. And the astonishing thing to me is 40% of the people don't use it. So I used to say in town meetings when people would call, would stand up and complain, hey, you, did you vote? No, no. Well, then you don't have a right to complain. David, you've talked about kind of why you're optimistic. And I know one of the things that feeds into that is this idea of human ingenuity mm. being part of the fuel of what makes markets positive over time. Can you tell us a little bit about well, that? Well, I mean, like uh, people asking, asking me now, what do they think, what's going to happen to the economy? I go, I don't know. It uh, may go down, but what I have real faith in is in uh, human ingenuity. And, uh, and this whole system really relies on the fact that, one simple fact that people want to make their lives better and it will make their lives better for their family. That's it. So when times get tough, so that they get disappointing results, they don't just sit there and take it. You know, they figure out how to get back on track. That's kind of the American way, and, and, uh, and that's, I think what's, that, that's why you're able to have a 10% return mm -hmm. over 20, the last 25 years when you have all these uh, horror stories. So I'm... I, I think ingenuity is just somehow get, um, gets second place and just needs to get more prominence here. And I think, because that's what will, so I don't know what's going to happen, but if we get into tough times, some people, we're going to figure out how to get out of them. Uh, I hate, I don't want to sound like a Pollyanna, but uh, that's, that's the way it is. Yeah. Well, it's been kind of the story of capital markets. I, I was talking with one of my colleagues earlier, uh, yes, yesterday actually, we were talking about this on the way back from a meeting. We were talking about this idea of ingenuity, just what you framed up. The idea is it's kind of a mutual self-interest. It's in the, you know, the interest of the person who's starting a company or with an idea. They want their idea to succeed. They're thinking this is gonna be a profitable idea to kind of get out in the world. And the reason the world's gonna wanna consume it is because it's gonna be good for them. Yeah, right. So it's a win-win. And uh, we sometimes lose sight of that, I think, in terms of thinking about how, what's really happening in a market or what's happening in a company. There are people producing solutions to human problems that are desirable. Yeah, you can't, you can't predict how people will react. You can, you can, I don't even think you can predict the situation, but I mean, <laughs> I, I can tell you conditional on, the, let's say you have a recession, um, people will do their darndest to get back on track. I said this in, I could, I spent a lot of time talking about this in March of 2020 when the pandemic hit, the market was way down. Yes. You know, I don't know what's going to happen from here, but you know, you got everybody working on this problem. I have faith that they'll come up with some good solutions, and that's that's what happened, and that's kind of what always happens. You know, it's amazing. Yeah. And one of the questions is, um, how many CEOs' ingenuity do you want to bet? What do you want to bank on? Well, if you're an active picker, you'll pick 5, 10, 15. They've got to come through. But if you pick the market, you've got several thousand people. So your <laughs> chances are enhanced that that human ingenuity is going to pull the whole market back up. Yeah, we've seen that. So uh, 
We're in a bit of a political season right now. I've been really fortunate. I don't know how many of you watch, uh, the more television that I watch in a streaming environment, the less political commercials I have to put up with. Yeah. That is a bonus of ingenuity. <laughs> but we are in a political season, and, and Senator, I, I was reminded, so someone in my office, this is awesome. So this is a sticker. It says, Bradley Buddy, 2020, I'm just gonna give you this. 2000. 2000. So somebody in my office, I want to say they were probably in high school. They were working as a volunteer for you when you were running for president in the Iowa caucuses in 2020. They, they showed me this and he said, I don't know if you can use this. I said, oh, yeah, I can definitely use that. Um, we'll, we'll be talking about that. But you've obviously had a lot of experience uh, in politics. We're in this election season right now. What, in terms of managing or helping with the state of uncertainty, how can the political system or people in the political system help with that? Is there help they can offer or is that really outside of the realm of what a politician can do in terms of help? Well, uh, let me just say I didn't have enough of these guys. <laughs> <laughs> in 2000, the Bradley Buddy, okay, I, I, need, a few, I need a few thousand more. <laughs> uh, uh, well, what you can do um, I mean, you know, it's three weeks before the election. There's not much you can do other than vote at this point. And um, longer term, I think, uh, again, as I said, the, you know, the story of America is the story of the vote. So we want to maximize the number of people who can vote. I don't think we have to be Australia, where we find people who don't vote, but we have to remove barriers from people voting. Uh, we have to... Um, you know, reduce the role of money in politics. I mean, you know, if you look at what's happened in the last 15, 20 years, you've had two Supreme Court decisions. One was uh, Citizens United in 1910. It said money was speech. You can't limit speech under the Constitution, so you can't limit money. And the other one was the one that um, essentially Supreme Court uh, found Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act invalid and the Voting Rights Act required any changes in voting laws, state and local, in about nine states, ten states, had to be approved before by the federal government. That law was uh, federal government. The Supreme Court invalidated that law, and within months there were major laws limiting people's right to vote in a number of those states. So these are the two areas, voting, and money are the two problems that we can deal with if you're in politics. Those are amenable to law changes, but there's something deeper that we all have to accept in terms of our own value structure, and that is there are two very deep principles, I believe, <coughs> that, that required for our democracy to be vibrant. One is elections decide. An election is held, one person wins, one person loses, okay, we go on. And the second, violence is never acceptable in terms of an outcome. So if we have those two action items and keep that attitude, uh, we're going to be all right. I like that. We're going to be all right. So uh, you guys are... If you want to give me the name, I'll be glad to yep. write the personal love, yep. love letter. <laughs> <laughs> We, I have a few more. I don't know. We, we could just put a 20 on there maybe or something. You know? um, so you guys are technically, I don't even know if you're technically retired, but let's say that you're not because it seems like you're staying plenty busy with a variety of projects and certain things you're working on. So I know one of them that we talked a little bit about a few weeks ago is you've been talking about this idea of purpose. Both, I think, in terms of how purpose relates to us as individuals, but also how it relates to organizations. So tell us a little bit about your kind of collaboration on this idea of purpose and articulating purpose and what you're hoping to accomplish there. Well, actually, that, I, I've learned a lot from the senator on this, uh, this point. I mean, it's, uh, um, it's so important that our firms, I know, starting from the beginning with uh, Jerry uh, and so forth, you know, the purpose is we want to improve people's lives. Uh, you know, you look at... Uh, uh, that 
all the improvements in, in investing and finance over the last 50 years, um, you know, uh, things are moving in the right direction. And if we're going to help in the future, if we're going to help more people out, it's got to come from better and safer financial services. So, I mean, that's a, that's a very valid purpose. I tell, you know, kids all the time, when you get to be my age, you want to look back and think somehow you helped, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. That's what, and it's so important to communicate that internally well and live by it, not just give lip service to it, but to actually uh, live by those words. I mean, every society, um, a company exists in an ecosystem in the society. And to the extent the company improves the ecosystem, then it has a public purpose. And I've argued for a long while that dimensional public purpose is to help people basically have better life. Foster group. You know, you want people to be able to preserve their assets so that they have enough to send their kids to college, deal with a health emergency, have a good retirement, maybe leave something to their children. And that's a public purpose. I mean, and it's so important because a lot of companies can tell you what they do. Not many companies can tell you why they do what they do. And I think that you can at Foster Group, and certainly David does every day mm -hmm. at Dimensional. Yeah. So roll that down to individual purpose. I'm kind of curious. Sorry. You guys seem like you're probably fairly purpose-driven or purpose-led people. You do the things you've done over the course of your lifetimes. To tell the president I'm not available. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Can you pass that over here? I have a couple of things I'd like to ask. You know. <laughs> so David, in terms of kind of developing this purpose mindset for yourself, is that something that's been with you for a long time, or have you been developing that over the course of your life? No, it actually was. I mean, look, when I was back in school, I was, uh, you know, in the PhD program working, uh, you know, uh, for, for Gene Fama and you know, up to my eyeballs and all this stuff. I go, uh, th all these ideas are amazing, and they're not getting applied. And, you know, uh, if you have a good idea but it's not applied, what good is it? I mean, it's, it's kind of like, and the question of a tree falls out in the forest does it make a noise, you know. It, it, you gotta have, you got to have a purpose or there's not much point in doing all that research, developing all these great new ideas, you know. It's, uh, so I said I, wanted, I want to go out and apply the ideas. Yeah, he became quite a conduit or a bridge between what was happening, at least at that time, the University of Chicago and other places where financial research was just going forward. I mean, it was all of a sudden it was part of the Nobel system. There were things happening, but it wasn't really getting into the ability, at least uh, the regular investor just couldn't access those ideas until you started to say, hey, let's get these things out. Well, these ideas have been recognized pretty, uh, pretty well by the uh, Nobel uh, uh, Committees in Economics. We just, you know, our fifth uh, director just got the Nobel uh, Prize a couple weeks ago. So we've had five uh, people that have been on either our mutual fund board or the board of the advisor to get their Nobel uh, Prize. Um, four of them, uh, was, we, they, they became a director before they got their prize. I mean, it's easy to hire them afterwards. <laughs> yeah, uh, the trick is to figure out who, you know, who's really doing the good work. It's that prediction them. thing, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been to the no, Nobel uh, ceremony twice in Stockholm. It's, if you have a, the opportunity, take it. It's really pretty cool. I bet um, it is. I bet it is. Senator Bradley, you had to be a fairly driven person, both playing basketball at the level that you played at, then achieving academically and then politically. What did the development of personal purpose look like for you? When I was 14 years old, I went to a basketball camp uh, that was run by a old pro named Easy Ed McCauley. And the campers were assembled on the floor and he said, remember, if you're not practicing, somebody somewhere is practicing. If you two meet, given roughly equal ability, he's gonna win. My workaholism began at that moment. <laughs> I was never going to lose because somebody outworked me. I arrive in the Senate. 
I'm on the Finance Committee. I'm 35 years old, youngest senator. Never been in a legislative body before. Go to the Finance Committee on the first day. I'm the junior member, so I'm way down at the end. Hi, Mr. Chairman. And uh, it's, uh, the discussion is about the Uruguay trade round, the Tokyo trade round, which is negotiating international trade agreements. I did not understand one word that was said in that room that day. I understood, you know, the nouns, I mean, the, <laughs> the, some of the verbs, some of the prepositions, but I didn't understand the concepts at all. Well, so you go back to work. So, you know, I had great parents, invested a lot in me. This work goal, this commitment to work was born early. And um, then you follow your passion. And the passion leads you in directions that you can't predict or can't listen to other people telling you what way you should go. I mean, you know, uh, so that's. Yeah. I think that's, yeah, we talk periodically about purpose or passion as well. And I think, you know, those words get kind of loaded in terms of they seem so big, but I like where you started with, hey, I needed to shoot a lot of free throws. It, you know, it was kind of it boiled it down to a pretty, this, my action right now is to work hard at being a better basketball player. And that kind of led to the next thing, which gave you an opportunity for the next thing. I appreciate it. Yeah, that. You, never, you never know if you do what you do today uh, with a real commitment and a belief that you're going to do as well as you can, it leads to something tomorrow. Yeah. I mean, now, does that mean that I never said in my life that I'd like to be a U.S. senator? Uh, I probably said that at some point, <laughs> but not immediately. And when I was in high school, I just wanted to be the best basketball player I could be, win the state championship. In college, was to win the NCAAs. I didn't do either, but in the pros, finally won a, a title. Uh, one thing flows to another, and uh, to me, that's... You have to have that discipline to, and patience to wait for those moments. David, you recently uh, signed something called the Giving Pledge. I read your letter. They post those things online. It's a similar thing to what uh, Warren Buffett and Bill Gates and some other people have done who have you know, quite a bit of wealth in terms of their thoughts on philanthropy and what they want to do with that wealth. Can you tell us a little bit about, one, how you got acquainted with that, and then what led you to that step? Well, I mean, first off, uh, yeah, those, those people started the giving pledge, but they were kind of a different scale than uh, <laughs> that we're talking about here with me. But, you know, I've been lucky to, um, as, as life progressed, I uh, was able to take care of the kids. I have two kids, and I've set them up with as much as I think it's reasonable to give kids. Uh, <laughs> And so the family is secure. And with that in mind, what are you going to do with this, uh, your money? I mean, it, it was really a non-decision. I mean, uh, the, the giving pledge it says you'll you'll give more than half of your money uh, on death. Um, what else are you going to do with it? I mean, <laughs> give it to the government. Yeah, you know, here, you know, the government. You spend the money so well. Let me give you some more. <laughs> So, uh, Someone's laughing over there about that. I don't know. <laughs> but, I, but I will say I've enjoyed, you know, all these things. We were chatting on, on the way over. Just uh, the, uh, the the thrill of giving uh, is, I mean, it's, everybody says it. And it's really true. I just, you know, he gave there, you know, this rules of basketball, you know, at, 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 uh, if you ever go to Allen Fieldhouse, you know, an hour and a half before the game, people are lined up a huge long line mm. wanting to go and walk by and take a look at it. That makes you feel good. Yeah. Uh, actually, funny, I didn't even think I'd tell you this. Uh, last week I was well, in New York and uh, uh, I'm walking down the street. All of a sudden, here's somebody yell, Rock Chalk! You know, I thought I'd just be hearing something. No, Rock Chalk! I turn around and it's some guy I'd never seen before. Comes up and just wants to shake my hand because of, he said, I just want to say thanks for all the stuff you do uh, for the university. You know, that kind of stuff makes you feel good. Yeah, you know, I remember going with David to the NCAA finals one year in Indianapolis. And I like to get to the arena early, old habits, so David does too. So we arrive in this 18,000 seat arena, 
and there are like 100 people in there. And uh, I see this guy two sections over start walking toward us and he's pointing, he's pointing. And I'm thinking, oh God, the guy wants an autograph. And he gets closer and he's saying, David Booth, you changed my life, you changed my life. <laughs> Can you believe that? I, I love to hear that story. Somebody you know, ignored him and... <laughs> but you know, this, this idea that David said, the joy of giving, you said joy was it, or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's really true. I'm sure everybody in this room has experienced it in one way or another. And occasionally in New York, I, I live in New York now, and occasionally in New York, I'll be in some, you know, uh, Chipotle or Pancatidian or one of these places, and I'll see a, a family. And I'll obviously not be from New York. Sometimes they're from abroad. Sometimes I listen a little bit. Sometimes they're from Louisiana. You don't know. And so I just tell the guy, I'll, I'll pay their check, right? And um, then when I, I wait around till they get the check and the waiter comes, it's paid for by that guy over there. And so why do I do that? It makes me feel good to do that. And David has a little bit more than picking up the check at the restaurant that he does. But it's the same general thought that, you know, Giving is a, is, a, is a wonderful, it makes the giver, I think, feel as good as the recipient if the person does it with the right spirit. David, you've managed to match some really interesting personal interests, I think, with your giving, with your philanthropy. One of the ones that I came across recently was a telescope or an observatory in South America that I think you've had a part in. Uh, oh, yeah. That's uh, fun. It, uh, 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 about a half a dozen universities have come together and decided they're going to build uh, the biggest goddamn telescope anybody ever made. Uh, and, and it'll be <laughs> down in Chile because uh, it's um, the closest place to being the end of the earth. You know, it's uh, the Anacama Mountains. And uh, it's an enormous project. And so I got uh, listening to these astronomers and they go, that is so cool. I mean, trying to figure out this little piece of light that you see, that, was, that, came, that came five billion light years uh, ago, you know. Now that, those kinds of numbers are just stagger me. So anyway, I'm going down in a couple of weeks and seeing the progress. That's awesome. I, I watched a video about the telescope, and they had a couple of students from the University of Texas talking about it. And... Uh, one of them was an astronomy program that was in physics, and they were just describing the opportunities that it's going to provide for research and education. It's just gone way up. So, I mean, that kind of a gift where it's really cool, but it's really cool, and it really provides a lot of opportunity for other people to kind of push things further. Yeah, yeah you have to invest. And, in you know, it's sometimes you look at things like that and you go, well, you know, what's the point? Well, you you don't know exactly what the point is, but you got to do those kind of things yeah. in order to make life better long term. Yeah. In a minute, uh, Jason Brown over here is going to uh, share some questions to other people, but he likes to talk about that idea of invest the way, just the way you did, where it's not just investing in financial markets, but it's investing in people, it's investing in projects and purposes, things that are, that are just bigger. Um, I, I enjoyed listening again to your... I think it was like a, a speech where they were thanking you for the gift of the University of Chicago. And you were describing, well, the, yeah, it's a gift, but it's really kind of like a dividend. Mm -hmm. I'm just returning back to the university a dividend because of what they in, invested in, in you. In me, right. I thought that was just a great mindset to think about investment. Well, one of the best things I ever did was leave the University of Chicago. I mean, uh, I could have gone on and been a professor, but I, I left. As everybody says, it worked out well for everybody. Me, the <laughs> university. <laughs> I like it. I like it. All right. Well, I've been watching the clock because I have a nice big one down here that I can see. And I want to make sure that we give the audience here, and I think there's been a number on the virtual people watching as well, that we can text questions in. And Jason Brown down here is going to help by 
He's been monitoring those questions. So, Jason? Yeah, congratulations to the two of you. I think we have far more questions than we've had at any event in the past. So, to those of you who have texted questions in, either online or here, I want to apologize because I do not think we're going to get to even half of them during this time. So, awesome. Senator Bradley, uh, you've got a new one-man show going on and that at least Kent and I know about. Would you be willing to tell us a little bit more about what you're doing these days? Um, well, the one-man show. Um, I gave my public papers to Princeton. They did a, a, a oral history interviewed 120 people. I invited them all to a meeting. I, I, 70 showed. I told stories about them afterwards. And one guy said to me, who'd never given me a compliment in my life, never, maybe the first championship, he said, nice going. Uh, <laughs> he, he said, you know, it sounds a little bit like Hal Holbrook. You ought to work it up. So from September to March of 19, I wrote this so-called one-man show. It's really a performative autobiography. And um, I started, did it in 15 places around the country. And I'd do it, and then I'd be reading it, and then people would give me their reaction. I'd take notes, rewrite, 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 rewrite. Then COVID hit. And during COVID, I was 97 days in a row in my apartment without getting air other than an open window. So well, I write, 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 write. And so last December, I did this one-man show in New York in a theater uh, four nights in a row and had five cameras. And uh, the film will be done in a couple of weeks. And um, then we'll see if anybody wants to see it. <laughs> I did like I, I, used, I write books. I write the book, figure out how to sell it. I, now I'm doing the movie, figure out how to sell it. It begins the following way. And you begin by bouncing a ball in the backyard, in the driveway, at the playground. And then you start shooting. Your knees are bent, your elbows under the ball, your eyes are on the rim. You shoot and you follow through. How simple the basic act is. I don't know when my interest turned to passion, but I was very young. That's the I beat. like it. It's awesome. Um, we're going to turn to basketball a little bit. So we have a rock chalk shout out from Omaha, Nebraska, <laughs> David. Uh, and just wanted some commentary on what the legacy there at the University of Kansas has meant to you and your family. And then I've got a basketball question for Senator Bradley, too. Well, I, uh, first off, I went to high school in Lawrence, Kansas, where the university is. Uh, I grew up on Naismith Drive. Um, and the first gift, I, the major gift I gave to the university was to build this Hall of, Ath Hall of Fame the, uh, annex on the building in memory of my parents, uh, you know, because uh, uh, so it means a lot to me. I go back, particularly that 12 minutes before the start of a basketball game, they do, th there's a tradition, they do things that, exactly the way they did when I was in school. And I think back, you know, all the good memories, think about my parents and things like that. So it's meant a lot to me. And congratulations on the big win in <laughs> April too. That was a yeah. Well, it's yeah. You know, winning's great, but it's uh, it's the excitement, uh, the thrill of these college kids running around. And, you know, it's a exciting sport. Senator Bradley, who's the best basketball player you ever played with? That I ever played with? Yeah. Or against? Your choice. Yeah. <laughs> My toughest opponent was John Havlicek. We were one-on-one, -on -one. and uh, if he, if I got 15 points, he got 25, and we won. It was a great night for me. <laughs> uh, smartest player to ever play is Bill Russell, in my opinion. He revolutionized the game with his mind. Um, so, um, and I remember, you know, pick your all-time team. Not a chance. <laughs> Uh, David, you founded Dimensional. You've recently stepped away. That can be a pretty tricky thing for founders to do, step away from these uh, companies that they've led so successfully. Um, talk to us a little bit about that experience. How has it been for you? What's been hard? What's been good? What have you been learning? 
Well, I've started working half time, seven in the morning to seven at night. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, no, let's step back, uh, you know, because, uh, and look at uh, the Foster Group with Jerry and stuff, you guys have been pioneers in this sort of thing. You know, it's, at the end of it all, you want to leave the company uh, with, uh, in great shape without a hiccup, any bumps. So you got to transition. And uh, the transition of management uh, is, we've, we've really put that into effect. It's great to watch these uh, younger people <laughs> um, um, do their thing. That's really one of the, the great things about management, seeing young people come in and thrive and find their way. Um, and so, you know, I, I, could, I try not to interfere, um, and it's, it's a great relationship. I, give, I can give them experiences of what we went through, something similar before and how it worked out, but it's their call. Um, and I like that, you know. I, I, but I do go in uh, five days a week, uh, pretty much. Um, not full time. I usually lean by three. So. <laughs> in at seven, done by three. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is maybe, Senator Bradley, you can comment, but I'm going to turn to Kent and David. We've got a question that went along the lines of, you know, the typical financial advisor that is any good is going to say, play the long game. So, <laughs> not news. Um, so the question was, does Foster Group or Dimensional do anything to try and improve investors' odds over the long haul? Uh, do they do anything intentional to try and create better than market returns or better returns than their competition? Wow. So all of that, you two could. It's a great question. I'll let you. Well, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I guess yes to all of that. The um, um, kind of the financial science that evolved that we uh, adhere to uh, has, has shown to work, it improve people's returns. You know, people are paying much less. Uh, the fees are, have come down a lot, and you have better diversification. Both those things improve your odds of, uh, of success. And then, you know, science has shown that there are ways of constructing a portfolio, you know, biasing it towards smaller and, uh, companies and lower price stocks. You can increase uh, returns a bit uh, over just a plain market portfolio. So all those things, uh, um, you know, it's worth fighting for every basis point. If you, if you can add one basis point, uh, well, I, I have the most recent numbers. The first fund we started was a small company fund. It's been going for almost 41 years now. And if you, uh, it's outperformed its benchmark by over one percentage point a year. And that may not sound like a lot, but over 40 years and nine months, <laughs> Uh, it makes the difference between having $45, uh, $1 investment going to $45 versus $75. And so it's worth fighting for every, every basis point. Yeah. I think one of the things that we've learned Ken, at Foster Group you, over the years. Oh, go ahead. Nope. David mentioned the term basis point. Yeah. What is that? Yeah. Okay. One one hundredth of a yeah. percent. Okay. So a very, very small uh, increment. Yeah. But the idea, and I think, uh, you know, our association with dimensional and the way that we think about portfolio construction, that question, yeah, I think the idea is you're always looking, you're always asking, you're always studying, is there something better that can be done? But I think one of the things that we've learned over time is there's a lot of stories out there. You know, last year we had Morgan Housel here, and one of Morgan's favorite phrases is the best story wins. <laughs> Sometimes the best story isn't necessarily a true story, or the best story isn't necessarily based on a depth of research that you can trust. So people have actually done the work to say, hey, is, is the science behind this really sound? Is there statistical significance in the research that we're looking at? And I know I was uh, down at Dimensional, gosh, at the Advanced Conference. They have a, they have a conference every year and they call it the Advanced Conference. And uh, I kid people because the first time I went to the Advanced, the Advanced Conference, Gene Fama 
Nobel Prize winner gets up there and he's talking finance and, and I think I hung with Gene for, I don't know, two minutes of a 60 minute presentation before I was lost. So, you know, you, Senator, you talked about being lost in a committee meeting. I was, so I gauged my growth as an investor in how long I can hang with Professor Fum when he presents. I'm up to about 40 minutes of a 60 minute presentation now. But I think the, the question's a good one and the thing to keep in mind when building a portfolio for the long term is you want it to be resilient you want it to be prepared for all different kinds of outcomes that may come along the way because we don't do a good job at predicting the future. No one's ever done a particularly consistent job at that. But if we're well diversified and we're using kind of financial science to our advantage, we have opportunities. And uh, yeah, whenever we see an opportunity that science says this is a way to press on that, let's do that with one caveat and then I'll stop because I'm not the guest. Um, but the thing that we always keep in mind, and I know I've heard you know, you say this too, is risk and reward are always related. And to press on the reward or on the return side, most of the time you're going to be choosing to bear a little additional risk. Now, if you have a long time horizon, you may be willing to do that because the probability is in your favor over time. Mm -hmm. But you, you don't get away with it. <laughs> there will be volatility and risk along the way. Well, no, I think you're on, you're on the right track there. It's, uh, I mean, I, so we answered the question about improving your odds. Um, um, but you shouldn't focus on returns as much as, the, uh, am I in control? Does it, have, have I done everything I can to control the process? Because at the end of the day, it's, it's really more about trust. Uh, mm. The individual returns, they'll come and go, and hopefully over the long haul, you'll, you'll pick up some extra returns. But it's, uh, can, you, can you trust the process? I think that's, I think that's what mm. it's all about. Yeah, I think you've said, I, sorry, I have way too many quotes from you, but one of them is, the great thing about having an investment philosophy is that you have an investment philosophy. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's something you can roll back and go, yep, this is the way we're progressing. And we think that's true. Um, David and Ken have both talked a lot about Nobel Prize winners and financial science. And I think that uh, the thing that we haven't talked that much about in terms of dimensional is the implementation of those ideas. I mean, those ideas are available to anyone out there who can read, right? They're professors, they've written it. But how does Dimensional take those ideas and make it work? And it has to do with the way uh, Dimensional implements those ideas. There's a large group, a large team that does nothing but the implementation. I'll give you just one example. Um, if you're an index fund and you have a stock that goes from small to mid, you're required by law to buy the stock that day. Well, what happens? It goes up, right? So Dimensional doesn't buy it that day. It waits a couple of days later when the stock comes back down. It then buys it. And so these implementation ideas are really important in uh, the success. And it all goes to what kind of person are you? I mean, you know, I know I'm a long-term and not, not a gambler. I mean, if you're a gambler, let's see, I got a couple of cryptos here that I think <laughs> might go very well. But if you, is 10% is enough a year for you? Um, seems to me if you did the math over 30 or 40 years, it should be pretty good. And then one other thing that you can't underestimate, and I know we're your foster group and so forth, is the value of the advisor. And Dimensional has a deep commitment to the advisor, foster group being one of them. And I remember I was at a luncheon down in Austin one day and there was an advisor from England. And we were talking and he said, you know, we have an unusual job. And I said, he said not many people have access to something so intimate as people's dreams. But we do, meaning the financial advisor. Because you're taking that responsibility to help people have enough for retirement, health emergency, et cetera. So uh, that's another, I don't wanna say secret sauce of Dimensional, but over time it's uh, proven to be an association rich in human relationships in addition to wisdom. 
Important question for David here. Uh, I've been a foster group for six years and DFA comes up and they're in blue suits all the time. They look great, buttoned up, ties, Ben and Mike, uh, just very handsome fellas. Uh, and uh, I was noticing your shoes and I wondered when you were able to start wearing all birds. Yeah, yeah, like it's, this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so you can't sell. I'm, one of the things that the pandemic is, I got used to not wearing those leather shoes anymore. I, I don't think I'll ever go back. You know, it's uh, <laughs> I think these are 150 bucks. I mean, it's a, a great value and whatever. Yeah. Um, By the way, I, I mean, I, I thought that yeah. the senator did bring up a good point, which is in, in the theme of dealing with uncertainty. How do you deal with uncertainty? You make the best informed choice you can. And for most people, uh, they need an advisor to help them think through how to make what is a good choice, make an informed choice. So that's a plug, and that's why we enjoy working with uh, you folks and other advisors. Last question, I suppose, uh, from the audience and me is, uh, what is the most fun, meaningful organization mm -hmm. gift that you have ever made? Mm -hmm. What have you enjoyed the most uh, as far as a gift? Or, and why? Or, or Organizational gift. I mean, to, to my yeah, like, my company or any other. No, company. that you personally. You know, you do a lot of philanthropy. The what's, uh, what's the favorite thing that you have or are supporting? I, I'm, I'm, um, well, I mean, I, at, at the at the. I have a lot of charities. I guess I'm still struggling with the with the question a bit, but uh, the. Um, Organizationally, uh, maybe uh, the best thing I ever did was put in a vacation policy. When, when we started the firm, everybody thinks they're so important that they, they can't, they, people were never taking vacations. So after a couple of years go by, I go, look, uh, you know, we didn't have a vacation policy. People just took what they needed. That doesn't work. <laughs> so that's my major innovation, put in a vacation policy. I didn't get the question. Uh, what's the most meaningful charitable gift that you've ever made? Oh, okay. Well, that's a little different. I'm, I'm my sorry. Daughter. Can, I, can I take my question? You can, yeah. You can have that one back. You can have it. What's the most fun you've had with a charitable gift? With a charitable gift? Yeah. Um, I think it is giving to an organization that has found a way to reach talented young people of all uh, races and ethnicities who are overlooked by the system and having them fill out a form and then getting them into their highest and best school in the process transforming lives. And the name of the organization is Quest Bridge and they've had uh, 14,000 graduates now. And these are, this is a kid who lives on a farm in Nebraska or Iowa or, or in a small town in Missouri, like me. Um, and their horizon is not great because they don't know. Well, Questbridge says, come in and fill out the form. However, they have 800 on their SATs and they're A-plus students. But the horizon would send them to the community college. You fill out the form Westbridge gets them in University of Chicago or Stanford or wherever. And we've had 14,000 people uh, now graduate and there are 4,000 in universities now. And it is an ultimate meritocracy and it will, and 80% of these kids come from families where neither parent went to college. And that's the most meaningful thing. Well, I, he got me involved in this. And I would say that is the most, I mean, it's, it's fun having, you know, the, the basketball stuff. But in terms of really meaningful, seeing these kids, uh, meeting with them and seeing how it changed their lives. And uh, it, it, that's very exciting stuff. And I think it's the way of the future. You know, we, we just have to educate our kids better. Mm -hmm. That's a great one to close with. Thanks, Jason.
Well, I want to thank you both for uh, spending time with us, making the trip <laughs> as exciting as it got to get you here on time. I'm glad you made it. Glad that we had this. Um, also want to thank Dimensional Fund Advisors. Uh, you guys have been great partners for Foster Group, and I know you know our clients and our firm have certainly benefited. Um, and you've helped to kind of promote this or sponsor this event tonight too, so we're super glad to have you here. Um, and we have a couple representatives from Dimensional over here as well, so if somebody had more uh, questions that you want to ask someone directly from Dimensional, uh, Michael and Ben are right down here. But David, I just wanted to say thank you for starting Dimensional and making it into the company it is. I think a lot of people have really benefited from the things that you've built there. Senator Bradley, thank you so much for spending time. This is a big deal. I mean, you started in New York this morning, you said, so, uh, you know, we appreciate you coming out here to where things really matter. Uh, you know, everything starts here. And I interviewed his wife on my radio That's show. That's exactly right. Yeah, was, we, we love that. Um, Many years ago, after my first visit to Foster Group. That was, yeah, and we should plug your show. Are you still on? Is the serious radio show still Absolutely. On Voices? Yep, so American Voices. Sunday morning. You want to hear some great stories? 10 a.m. Central yes. Standard Time. Fantastic. <laughs> Channel 124. <laughs> Sirius XM. American Voices with Senator Bill Bradley. That's awesome. <laughs> well, we were fortunate to have you here in 2016, right after I think your book, uh, this particular book, came out. You had, obviously, a number of other books as well. And we appreciate your service. I especially appreciate your service in Washington as a senator. I know a challenging place, challenging environment to serve. It seems like it's a little rancorous these days. So I'm continuing to be hopeful that there will be thoughtful, ethical, generous people like yourself who will choose to engage in public service because it's not a fun place to watch, at least from the outside <laughs> looking in right now. So thank you for your, your service in that way. Thank you. A um, couple things, just to uh, close up here at Foster Group, our team really, we uh, like to think that we're a values-based group. We try to emphasize character, competence, and care. We go to work every day wanting to give people what we think is wise financial counsel so that you can live lives of meaning and generosity. That's really what kind of gets us up. I know at times like this when things are investment, uh, investment markets are uncertain, you know, folks come in to talk to us about answers, but I think a lot of times they just, we just want to have conversation and how to make sense out of what's going on. So, um, you know, we've set up our company to try to put our clients at the center of it. We're employee-owned, we're team-based. We are really focused on trying to get people with the right advisor, the people who have the expertise to get the things done that are important to you. And so if you haven't had a chance to talk with uh, one of our advisors, uh, you know, we're, I think there's some name tags you can kind of see who's who here. We'd love to talk with you when this is over. Um, at the end of the day, I'd say this, we just want to make sure the people we work with feel like your financial life is truly cared for. That's what it's about. Uh, we want to care for people, and we've been given the opportunity to care for a lot of people coming in kind of their financial life door. So uh, thank you for attending. This is kind of the end of the broadcast portion. I'll have a few more announcements after that. But for this part, I think it'd be nice if we would just thank again David and Senator Bradley for being here.